I'd like to welcome you all to today's workshop, Tips for Successful Virtual Class Sessions. My name is Dan Cabrera. I'm the Multimedia Coordinator for Faculty Development. I've been here for, uh, well, since 2002 and offering a lot of workshops that are multimedia related, but a lot of workshops that also have to do specifically with Blackboard and providing one-on-one -on -one consultations and writing documentations for that. This is the agenda for the next hour. Uh, we'll start with introductions. I'll mention a little bit about the software programs that are available for doing virtual class sessions. Talking about some of the challenges that may arise from doing this and something to be at least aware of. Preparing for online sessions, management that's actually during the session, and then follow up. What happens after you, you do an online session? So let's just start with the guidelines. I'm going to ask people to use the chat. Uh, section to ask questions or to make comments. Okay, in fact, uh, we've already gone through the, the next one, which is raising hand to speak, but I'd like everyone to click on the chat bubble and then just type something in. Well, actually, no, hold on. <laughs> actually, we'll be doing that in a minute when I ask people to introduce themselves. So just hold on, for, we'll, we'll be doing that. And then uh, intermittently, I'll be asking, I'll be stopping at certain sections of my presentation to ask for discussion. So we're going to call this discussion checkpoint. So people can ask questions at that point or make comments. So now we can use the chat feature. So I'd like you to, to input your name, your department, uh, whether you've hosted or attended any online virtual class sessions before today. So if you'd say, yeah, yeah. So my name would be Dan Cabrera, my department faculty development. Then I'd say, yes, I've hosted. And yes, I've actually attended online virtual sessions. And then uh, specifically what you are seeking to learn today. What is it about online instruction or that experience uh, you'd like to learn something about? So if you could all just click on the chat feature and then type that in, that would be great. And once that happens, once that happens, uh, I'll expect to see things popping up. All right. All right, Dawn says, Dawn, she is from uh, Communicative Disorder. Disorders um, have attended online courses. You want to enhance the student experience online for more student engagement and active learning. Thank you, Don. Denise, she is from the Department of Marketing. She's attended sessions and she's teaching uh, a case method in her MBA courses and wants to have engaging virtual sessions. Fantastic. Ryan says uh, he's from communications and he has attended online sessions from faculty development. My good friend Matt, College of Law Library. Uh, he's not hosted, but he has attended, and he wishes to learn more about the particulars of online virtual instruction using technology available. Bill, uh, uh, from music, he's he's attended, and he wants to learn best ways to organize online courses or, or sessions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on. So virtual class sessions, uh, the virtual class sessions of which is kind of, it's kind of funny. I mean, we're actually in one already. Uh, so it actually sort of uh, addresses the issue. Uh, it is any session, any synchronous session that's going to be in real time that's done in an online environment using one of, of many different types of uh, software programs or communication services, as they're saying. Uh, one of them is the one we're using is Blackboard Collaborate. And I've seen a number of iterations on Blackboard Collaborate. Actually, and originally it was Wimba. And then it became uh, Blackboard Collaborate. And now what we're, we're using now is called Blackboard Collaborate with the Ultra Experience. Although I think they want to sort of eliminate that extra and just, just uh, defer to the original term, which is Blackboard Collaborate. The interface actually looks a lot different than it used to. Um, other people on campus use Adobe Connect, uh, although it's not nearly as, as, as popular as, uh, as Collaborate. Other people have used Skype, and in fact, that's something people use not, even, not just in an academic environment, but they use, you know, for personal uh, reasons. Uh, last week, we were um, in the online teaching symposium on Friday, and, and we had a guest speaker who was from, from California, and she used something called Zoom. And Zoom was fantastic. I really, really uh, liked that. And in fact, I was talking to one of my colleagues about perhaps maybe looking into Zoom, although it probably has a, uh, a site license uh, cost associated with it. All right, so the first question that we should all ask, especially if we haven't conducted an online session, is 
uh, using technology, does it solve a problem? All right, so you ask the question, do I, need, do I need it to conduct virtual sessions? Well, do I need to conduct a virtual session? And I guess the question uh, is, is important to ask because sometimes that's literally not, not uh, necessary. If you have a face-to-face -face session, then you'll have your face-to-face -face sessions. However, even for those uh, classes that you have face-to-face -face sessions, it may be that you are um, hosting a virtual office hour. Okay, and so students who might not be able to come on campus so readily, and maybe you, you have a virtual office hours like I, uh, I mean, you have a face-to-face -face office hour scheduled for Thursday morning. Not all people can do that, but I do have a virtual uh, online office hour Wednesday evenings from seven to eight o'clock, and then people can come on, on that too. And I can even schedule for if that time still isn't isn't uh, possible, I can schedule maybe another time using the same technology to meet. Uh, in an online environment. Uh, so students don't really have to worry about travel. But along with great responsibility or great power comes great responsibility. And that might be viewed in, uh, in, uh, in, the term, in terms of challenges. What are some of the challenges of, uh, of online teaching? And I'd have to say that, well, it all depends on, you know, where you stand on an issue depends on where you're sitting. And so it can be something which is extremely challenging and almost impossible to overcome. But I'm going to say that that's probably not going to be the case for most of the challenges that we'll be discussing today. So let's just uh, let's just straight up talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of those challenges. Well, one of course is the limited oral, visual, and oral communication uh, cues. And so. Um, that would be like sitting in a class face to face and being able to look at your students and then as you're speaking with them, being able to see their body language, maybe even confused faces. And that's always nice to be able to see because you can you can infer from that that there is uh, there's some question. Uh, people are not certain about exactly what you're saying and then you might actually be able to jump ahead and, 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 and ask them, well, there are some questions. Um, and in this picture right here, we have this uh, this gentleman right here. He doesn't seem like he's on board entirely. I don't know. Maybe that's his natural look, but uh, maybe this gentleman uh, who who might see that might say, okay, maybe maybe there's something that's not clear, and ask and ask if there's a need for clarification. So that's one of the challenges. Another is managing text and audio chat. So right now, I've been doing it for for quite a while. And so it's not such a big deal as I'm presenting content and try to look into the camera uh, directly so that it looks like I'm actually talking to, to you individually. Um, but with all these things at the same time, sometimes it can be challenging, especially if somebody asks a question and if I'm not paying attention, I might miss that. This is why one of the important things in, in setting up your, your, course, your sessions is that you want to have maybe an audio tone that actually signifies it. So if I'm not looking up at the time this question comes up and it'll pop up you know, somewhere on this interface, I'll be able to hear that and it'll catch my attention. So uh, it's just a matter of getting used to something uh, like anything else. I remember when I was learning to, to drive many, many years ago and I, one, of my, uh, one of my uncles, my Uncle John, said learning to drive is like uh, playing linebacker. He played linebacker when he was in, when he was in uh, high school. You have to see exactly what's going on on the field ahead of you to your side and even behind. And although that's pretty daunting, that's pretty much how I drive now. I'm always looking forward to the side and behind uh, whatever is happening. And so that's what's going to happen as you do this more and more. That skill will be developed and refined and it won't be uh, so, uh, so overwhelming. Um, Others is answering questions. Sometimes an individual has a question, but they're, for whatever reason, holding back on asking the question. And, and, and so intermittently, you ask the people, you ask your students, your participants, the audience members, if they have a question regarding this. And you give them some time to, uh, to respond to that. One of the nice things about doing this in an online environment, when somebody asks a question, um, people aren't feeling uncomfortable as, as everyone is staring at them. That, that challenge actually is removed. You're relatively anonymous. People know your name, but they don't actually see you unless, of course, you're using your webcam. But even then, it's 
what's the big deal? Connection issues is another challenge. Connection issues because sometimes people rely on Wi-Fi. Whenever in my own courses I have my students making presentations using the same technology, I will always recommend that they use a wired connection uh, because you can't really count on, on Wi-Fi. It may be weak. Uh, it may be problematic. They may be, their, their computer may actually or their mobile device may be a, a distant, uh, a, a certain uh, distance uh, from the router. And so that's always going to be a consideration. And some people look at that as, as, as somewhat being less flexible. Well, I'd like to use my Wi-Fi, and why should I not? Uh, why should I be kept from it? Uh, but in fact, it's something that um, is uh, is something to be considered uh, concerned about. Other challenges that students uh, face is they're not always ready for online sessions, uh, and it may be that they've never had the experience. And so you, as the instructor, really it's uh, it's important for you to consider that maybe I'll have to do a little bit of, of coaching for my students and that might be that you'll have a, a video that you send them to and in fact we, we do have videos in fact when, when you initially got on you might have been prompted to look at uh, tutorials for this software program and that's something that you might want to encourage your students to do well before any online sessions all right technology access well of course you know if this is an online course uh, that you that you're working with then the assumption is that students do have uh, technology access they have a computer or they have a mobile device that they can use if they do have a mobile device uh, you know it's, it's likely that they'll be using the application, the Blackboard application, either uh, for, for most students it's going to be Blackboard student uh, and for you as the instructor you might be using the app Blackboard instructor, okay, but it is available. Internet, internet uh, capabilities, I just sort of went over the challenges with people using Wi-Fi um, and in fact they have the option of using Wi-Fi or a hardwire, Ethernet connection, that they do that if they're presenting, but if they're sitting in and they're having some issues uh, then of course, a wire a wired connection is is something they might want to seriously uh, consider. Distractions. All right. So now we're here. You know, you're sitting all in your own offices, or maybe you're you're at home. Uh, maybe there's a phone. Actually, you know what? Now that I remember, I'm going to take my phone off. Okay. Uh, you want to make sure that that any distraction, any possible distraction, is is not up and running. Uh, so that in the middle of making a presentation, you have to stop to answer a phone. That that's really awkward. All right, or if you have multiple monitors like I do right here, and you have something like a Facebook, and something pops up, maybe someone sending a message to you through Messenger. Yeah, you want to be able to avoid that. So you want to make sure that your students are not going to have that that uh, as a possible distraction. Passivity. That simply means that students are just sitting there and not doing anything but listening to you, and that uh, that that tends to to I guess wear thin. You know, people maintaining. Communication, maintaining attention is really becoming more and more in dif uh, difficult. So you want to make sure that you're engaging your students by involving them in a number of activities that requires their attention. And, and simply presence. Uh, how do you establish that presence? Okay, well, one of them is to hear me speaking, okay, as the instructor or the moderator. Another one is to, is to actually have uh, uh, a visual image. And so I actually do have a... Uh, uh, my video on. I'm not a real big fan of that. Uh, maybe initially, yeah, absolutely. Starting uh, to have people to to notice that there's a real person that's not a disembodied voice who's who's actually speaking with them. So I just want to make sure that that you know that that's also important in other aspects of in, uh, of instruction where you show an instructor presence. But it's particularly important in an online environment because students need to know that that really they have a question that real person is going to be there to respond to that. One way of addressing this particular challenge, uh, especially if you're not certain about what uh, the capabilities your students have regarding technology, is to actually give them a technology survey. And that's maybe something you, you put it in the Blackboard course uh, somewhere about, uh, and just say it's a survey of student access, asking them questions about computers, uh, internet connections, and timing. I know that we have this in our Blackboard One course where, where we actually have people go through this survey and respond to the survey. And survey, of course, is not the same as a quiz because the survey doesn't have a right or wrong answer. It's just uh, sort of getting a sense of the profile of the capabilities of, of your students. So that's something you might want to consider addressing so that you can assess the degree of challenge for your students, at least in regard to technology access. 
So uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of those points where I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask if you have any questions. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to ask you, what other challenges uh, can you think of that I may not have mentioned? And if you want to um, input right there, you can either raise your hand and then if you have a microphone, you can, you can get on and, and ask the, uh, or, or mention. Or you can just use the chat feature and then just type something in that I may have missed. All right, so I'm going to wait a, a minute or so and look at the chat feature. Um, I'm going to put down... I can't think of any other, but of course I have a bias in that way. But if you think of something I, I missed, it, that could be a, a challenge. Thank you, Denise. Uh, what is your setup? What is on your monitors? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Whatever you have, like I, I've got three monitors open up right here, and I've got, I will be honest with you, I do my Facebook open. I was, I was looking before I got on like this, but I'm not looking at it right now. Okay, I'm going to be looking at you, the, I promise, the whole time. Uh, but absolutely, that is, that is a distraction, and that can be a challenge. Um, uh, now, interesting you should mention that, Denise, because I do have two monitors that are just focused on, on this session. One of them is an iMac, one of them is Windows, and so I'm, I'm in on one as a participant and in on the other as a instructor. And I use this setup so I can, so I know for a fact what you people will be seeing. All right. All right, I don't see any others. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Thank you so much, Denise, for your contribution. So let's let's look about uh, look into the preparation. This is before the actual online uh, session begins. You ask yourself some questions. Who is my audience? Are, the, are these audience members uh, as students of of uh, are these millennials? Are these people who have grown up with the use of technology and are digital natives? Uh, are they Generation Zers? And Generation Zers are the ones who are now entering. Uh, freshman year, maybe that maybe this past year was was the first uh, cohort of generations of years. But in spite of the fact that they're close in in I guess um, in their ages to the millennials, they actually are different. They actually have a different life experience. There's actually a um, a textbook, a recently re a re a released book that actually distinguishes the characteristics of this Gen Z. -er. Uh, population um, and so with that experience now we also have individuals who may be not even uh, Millennials people who are a little bit older people who are more in my uh, my age range who may not have a lot of experience technology uh, te uh, technology wise another is what are my objectives what is the purpose of having an online teaching uh, scenario like this now I do have a one face-to-face -face, um, I'm sorry one online session with the students that I teach for ethical decision making for healthcare professionals leads to it's to socialize them into the course what are the expectations of the course even go through the um, organization the blackboard course organization so that they're familiar with it uh, what they're expected to do every week of course listen to the pre-recorded lectures and and then of course do the uh, uh, the weekly quiz and the weekly discussion board assignments. And so this is a great opportunity for me to use that technology. But since I am, I have already recorded my lectures, they don't really need to have it every single week. However, I do, as I mentioned earlier, I do have a weekly, uh, weekly office hour. And I do have students come to that. And it's probably as well attended as people, as if I had a face-to-face -face setting, if it, was a, a, if it was a course that was face-to-face. -face. And people would expect to have a real face-to-face -face meeting with me in my office. Uh, but since the course that I teach is entirely online, it makes sense to have uh, an online uh, presence for that. And that's what I use the, uh, the uh, online sessions for. Okay. And then what, what is my format? Am I using this to present information? Well, today I am, actually. I'm, I'm using it to present uh, information with um, uh, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint slides presentation. But when I'm offering um, the online office hours, obviously I don't have a, a lot of, prep, a lot of uh, slides to present. And so it's more of a discussion. So the, the format will, in fact, change. Okay. When preparing for uh, your... Uh, online session, it's really important to set the dates and the time early so students are aware of that. Now, this is important for me because the first and only session that I have 
that is online is the very first session and so maybe two weeks before the course actually begins I will send out an email I'll open up make the course available and I'll say hey by the way this course is entirely online and although we don't have a regular meeting session there is the one exception and that's the first session and I will tell them so that they know uh, in advance now sometimes people have scheduled a session that actually is conflicting with that they may actually have uh, for me, it's a Tuesday evening. They may already have a Tuesday evening class, uh, and that might be face-to-face. -face. We're online. In that case, I said, well, don't worry about it. I'm recording the session. I don't really share that because it might be that if people knew that it was being recorded, that no one would show up. And part of the the um, the value of having people show up is to, is to develop that, that social, that instructor presence, and also develop a sense of community early on in the course. And also, I mean, people have questions to ask. So those people who are actually here ask questions that people who watch the recording would not have an opportunity to ask and say, hey, that's a question that I wanted to know. Okay, so this is kind of an, uh, an interesting thing. You also want to make the links easily available, easy to find. And of course, um, in using this, what I did for you today is to send you a link. But if it's going to be part of the course, it's going to be part of the, of the structure of the, the interface of the course, what I like to do is to add a link in the course navigation menu. And it'll say Blackboard Collaborate. Obviously, if I'm using Adobe Presenter, I mean Adobe uh, Connect, I would have another link for that. So they would click there and then it would be able to get into the session. Okay. So you want to make the links easy to find and predictable and consistent. You don't want to you know want to use one link one time and then choose a different way of, of, of sharing that another time. You also want to provide time for students to connect uh, to test their connections in advance. So usually what I'll do in that two weeks before we actually have a face the online session is I'll say I want you to get into the course um, session um, which is available and I'll share what that looks like in a minute uh, and then just go in and just make sure that you can act that there's no problem with getting in and staying in um, and I'll also mention that you'll we'll try it with a Wi-Fi and try it with a, a, a wired connection if you're having a problem with that so you want to make it uh, something to do well in advance so that wouldn't be like maybe 20 minutes before the session send out an email and says hey test the connection mm, you want to do that well before that I'd mention uh, the type uh, in preparing. What are you going to do? What is the format? Is it going to be strictly dissemination of information? Um, is it going to be uh, an opportunity to just sit here and, and have a discussion? Which possibly I could do if, in fact, I might want to have a preparation for, um, um, I guess, maybe a review before we have the midterm or the final examination so people can ask me questions. Uh, and then in that case right here, I wouldn't be really presenting content. I would just be sharing information with them uh, re regarding that. Uh, or maybe some combination of the two. Also have the opportunity to have an, a video chat. So in this case, because I'm having my slides, it kind of sort of takes up the screen. But if you look uh, down below here, probably on the right-hand side, you're going to see you're going to see my, uh, my video image. It's going to be a thumbnail. It's very small. But if I was to stop sharing the slides, of course, you'd be able to see everything. Uh, so a video chat and audio chat so if I turned off my my camera you'd be able to you'd still be able to hear me or simply a text chat and usually what happens is like we're doing in this session right here you guys are conducting a text chat with me and I can read it everybody else can read it and I can respond accordingly all right now also in preparing uh, for any presentation you want to have your questions ready to go and so you might want to type the questions out before the session begins and you might actually have the questions as part of the slide presentation or you might actually have a, a separate you know piece of paper that actually has those questions if they're not going to be in the presentation and you want to ask focused questions and so the questions that I would ask are not really generic questions they, the questions will be specific to the content and I might even be more focused and I might say Bill uh, what do you think of this and so of course Bill paying attention he would immediately respond to to my inquiry. So these are some some considerations in developing it to make it a little bit more engaging uh, for the students. Uh, in terms of the design of the presentation, you want to keep it really simple. You can see right here, I have a lot of open space. There's not a lot of busyness in mine, and 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 uh, that's really uh, to keep a focus on what we're talking about rather than extra things. I want to use larger font sizes and then what I would say is probably no less than 24 point. Uh, it gets too small uh, and you can see right here this is sans serif, uh, sans serif I guess is how you would present, uh, uh, say that. 
Um, and, and that means that there are no uh, extra squiggly lines or anything like you get in Times Roman. Uh, the reason for that is because sometimes uh, it doesn't render very well and, and people are not quite sure what a word would say if, if there's some, if it's too small, first of all, if it's too text heavy, there's a lot of content and it's uh, as serif. So now it has these extra, extra lines that make it more difficult to read. So you want to use larger font size and sans serif. And you want to keep the slide information short. Uh, these should really be more bullet points. And so these are jumping off points for discussion. So if I say uh, keep the slide content information short, that might lead off to a, another discussion about that. The images you should be, uh, you use, if you use images, should be powerful and they should be relevant. Uh, one of the things about multimedia presentations is that people sometimes think, well, I need to add a, uh, an image just because. And if it's relevant and if it's a powerful image uh, and it's relevant to what you're talking about, then it does have an impact. And students uh, or individuals are more likely to remember the content. However, if it's just a, an image just for the sake of having an image and it's not related to what you're talking about, it actually can be a distraction. So you want to make sure that you select your images uh, carefully. Uh, you want to include interactive elements to... Uh, to involve your audience, okay, and that could be a number of different activities. Like I asked a question, you know, and I asked people to introduce themselves, and so now people feel a little bit more involved in what's going on, and, and, and the fact that I was reading out the responses really uh, gives the, the sense that your input is valued. Uh, you might want to have question checkpoints, which we will have in just a moment. Uh, just make sure that st students have an opportunity to raise their hand, raise their concerns, and ask uh, interesting questions uh, that can be responded to, and maybe even uh, discussions. And so I might actually, as one possibility, um, put people into breakout rooms. Okay, so this would be an example of an interactive activity. Right now I have a map of the world. It's kind of, granted, it's kind of small, but I might want to ask students, and, I'd, and, and I would have shown them beforehand, that there's annotation tools in the upper left-hand corner, and I'd say, okay, I'd like you just to, to identify where you're from. And so right here, I'm going to click on pencil. I'm going to, uh, where, where are you born? And so I might, let me just see. Uh, I might sort of identify. I'm from California. I'm from Southern California, born and raised in, in, in Los Angeles. And I asked people to do that. They might actually start filling out this thing. Now, the map's kind of small uh, and I'm not really fair. I mean, if, uh, if, if we, I knew everyone was from the United States, I might have a larger map of the United States. But the point is that people have an opportunity to interact and, and it's a little bit more engaging. They're not really passive. Or I might ask a polling question, you know, where, uh, where, where uh, will you go on vacation this summer? And if I did set this up as a polling question, uh, I'd ask people to say, are you going to, are you going to go and spend your vacation in state? It could be down in Champaign. Uh, which is a, technically, of course, it is in state. Or I said, oh, no, I'm going to go to California for the for – so I'd put uh, – people would respond out of state or out of country if you're going to be traveling to another country in Canada, Mexico, or um, uh, any country in Europe or Africa. Or if you say, you know what, uh, I'm not really going on vacation this year, I, or I am on vacation, but I'm going to stay home, so it's, gonna, it's more of a staycation than a vacation, and some people would be responding. Of course, now this is just a silly uh, – uh, uh, inquiry about about this, but whatever question you would ask would have direct relevance to the content you're presenting. Okay, and that's the point is that you'd have that. I did mention briefly the possibility of putting people into uh, breakout groups or breakout rooms. So if you imagine you're in your face-to-face -face environment and you'd say, okay, I've got I've got 20 people. I'm going to break them up into five groups of four, and they're going to go off into different corners of the room so that people can, can talk with each other. Well, you can actually recreate that scenario in your session, especially with, um, with Adobe, I'm not Adobe, uh, well, actually, possibly Adobe Connect, but definitely with uh, Blackboard uh, Collaborate. Uh, when I have my students in, in a session and I want to have them work on a problem, I will, I will manually put them into different groups and give them time and, and essentially it will recreate what we're seeing right here uh, where students can actually talk to each other, they can text each other, or not text each other, but chat with each other and then come up with a solution to a particular problem and then I'll bring them all back and one person will represent the group and they'll say, well, this is, the, this is our solution to the problem. 
So breakout rooms are a really great uh, feature for engaging students. When you start your presentation, you're going to have some introduction, introductory slides. So the first slide should let the students know what the, that they're in the right place when the session starts, what time it starts, and anything they need to do to prepare. And, and information like the title, the date, the start time preparation. You can see that this is what I did for our own session. You know, of course, best practices. You want to be a good model for what you're promoting, and so that's what I did for that. Uh, so individuals who come to the session know that, yep, I'm in the right place. Okay. Other slides might include how to interact with the session software, and indeed, I, I included that uh, in my own, especially pointing out different areas of the interface so that students know how to uh, or participants know how to respond. You might also want to have an agenda, which I did, um, so people know that this is the direction that we're going, and session uh, session guidelines as well. You can see I still have my annotation tool on, you know, for uh, writing over certain areas. Okay, this is an example of uh, of having a slide that actually has information regarding the interface. Okay, so now if your students are new to this, you might want to include something like this. But once you've done it several times, you're going to assume that your students are fairly used to it, comfortable with it, and and don't need to be prompted as much. Uh, the thing that I always do, even today, even as much as I, if I as I've used this online uh, web conferencing tool, I always practice. I review my presentation materials. I look at my discussion questions. I test the features that I plan to use. I record my voice occasionally, not so much now because I'm pretty I'm, I'm pretty uh, confident that it's going to work, and I review it. And sometimes I'll even ask one of my colleagues to come into the session. Can you hear me? Can you see this? You know, this is what's happening. Is that what's happening? Is that you're, you're seeing? However, as I mentioned, since I have a second computer and I have a different browser, and I go in as a different person, as, as, a, as a participant instead of the instructor, I can actually see it myself. I can verify that what, I'm sh what I think I'm showing is actually what, the, what participants are actually seeing. Uh, setting up your environment, I, I mentioned and strongly suggest that people find a, a, fi a quiet place free from distraction. So I'm turning off all cell phones and all uh, phones and, and, and then maybe put a sign outside your door, if especially in your office, do not distract, please do not disturb. Turn off any notifications. And so I have notifications for my email for, for Outlook. I turn those off before I went on because I don't want to have any disturbing noise. It might actually not be dis disruptive to you, but it would be disruptive to me to hear something and then see, oh, so-and-so is responding to my email. I might want to dim the lights. Now, you, you can probably tell now if you look behind me that I do have uh, shades. If I was to undo that, there would be a lot of backlighting and it would be it would be a distraction to you and it might be more difficult to, 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 to see me not that I want to show me in in perfect uh, Panavision uh, but it's something that you want to consider remove any distractions I did have a few things behind me some books in, on the credenza behind me that I that I moved because I don't want to be looking at what book is he reading so I want to remove any distractions. Of course, I already mentioned the do not disturb notices uh, uh, so that uh, no one's going to be knocking on my door. And of course, turning off the phone ringer. These are all things that you may not necessarily think about, maybe maybe some of them, maybe most of them, but maybe not all of them. But these things for sure are things you want to include in your checklist of preparation. Okay. You want to dress well. Now, I'm not saying that this is dressed well. This is just a polo shirt. But it's a single color polo shirt. It doesn't have all kinds of crazy designs. It's not Hawaiian, uh, although I, I do like Hawaiian, and I do have a Hawaiian shirt, but I'm going to wear it for this. Uh, and I know a lot of people say, well, I'm teaching online. It doesn't matter what I'm wearing. OK, if you're turning on the webcam, everyone can see you. Uh, I'd like to tell the story of this uh, one uh, session, the first session a couple of years ago of the course that I teach. As I mentioned, I, I, did have, I do have a one online session and I had one student who turned on their their camera and they they, they were watching on a I guess it was a, a MacBook Pro uh, it's a laptop and they were walking around their house as they were carrying this and I could see everyone could see what was going on and her house was a mess and I said oh you know Tiffany you probably want to turn that off we can see what's going off and she slammed the the uh, um, she let she slammed the laptop shut she was so embarrassed, but she, everyone had a good laugh, and eventually she also found the humor in that. But it's good to know that you don't want to show people things that you are embarrassed about. All right, creating a session. This is an important feature uh, in, uh, in 
Blackboard Collaborate, and I'm also assuming in Adobe, um, uh, Adobe Connect, it's important to create a session, but you don't have to, and I'll show you that in just a minute. You can make the, sh the uh, make sure that the session link is available and free. One of the things that I did when I created a session for this particular workshop was to test it, and it, it worked fine, and I can see that uh, we have almost everyone here. I'm going to look to see. Uh, do, 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 do. Yep. Okay. All right. So make sure that this, the session link is available as soon as and provide support information. I did have, in fact, a uh, because I was using Blackboard, the Blackboard Collaborate uh, technical support line information, okay, which, as I mentioned, is 24/7 available. So let me just show you what it looks like if you're using if you're using the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra uh, thing in your Blackboard course. If you look here, you can see that there's a course room, and it says it's unlocked. Course room means that it's, it's the it's the default course room that you would use, and and typically that's what I will use when I when I have my students coming into the session. Okay, so that's that's the that's the course room. However, I do have the option to create a session, and that's what I did for this particular workshop. Um, this is an example of that. Now, this is an example of of my own course. I actually create. Uh, virtual class uh, classrooms for all of my the groups in in my classes. I don't do it for of course every individual. That would not make any sense at all. I guess, but I do make it for for each group that I've created, so people can actually have a virtual place to meet. Since it's an online course, I can't expect people to come on campus and meet in the library or a lounge area. So this actually gives them some some additional features and skills. Um, usually, I'll have a greeting slide prepared, like "Welcome to today's session," uh, but you don't need to greet everyone as they arrive. I did because it's a small group, uh, and, I, and I I could do that as people were coming in. Um, and you might also take this opportunity as people come into the session to remind them to take notes during the session. Now, because I record this, it's not necessary to do that. Uh, in fact, I'm recording this session right now, so if you're not taking notes, you can always come back and review it, and I'll send out a link to to the video when it becomes available to everyone on this session. But there's something you might want to ask your students to do. Uh, usually what I'll do is 45 minutes to 30 minutes before, I'll log in, make sure that there's no problem, and that's what I did today. I'll open up the session 10 to 15 minutes before the start, me as the instructor, as the moderator, just to make sure that everything is working. And then actually, in truth, I will do that the day before, just to make sure that everything is fine. And uh, I will. Uh, also, consider maybe waiting five minutes for latecomers, uh, since we didn't have a whole lot of uh, people who were not already on the session. I felt that maybe after one minute, I could start today's session, which is what I did. Okay, so that's preparation. So at this point, once again, I'm going to ask, are there any questions or comments about this idea of preparation, preparing for your online session? And I'll look at the chat area. Or I'll see if anyone raises their hand. Okay, looking, looking. Actually, it's a compliment on my on my speaking skills. I guess I I covered everything. <laughs> uh, not really, but I don't see anyone uh, asking any questions. So I'll assume that there's none to be uh, to be asked. Okay. So let's move on to the next aspect of online, uh, virtual online sessions, and that's management. Uh, you may ask the audience uh, from time to time questions. So you address questions to the person who should respond. And so I might ask a question, and it may be a generic uh, a question, a specific focus question, but it may be to, to anyone in the class. So I'll say, you know, like I just asked uh, a few seconds ago, does anyone have any questions about regarding preparation for online? And nobody responded, so I might I might ask um, I might ask let's see uh, Matt Matt do you have any questions about this and Matt might say no I'm 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 good okay so you might want to just do that and that's another opportunity to to actively engage uh, students in your course all right to make sure that they're they're on their toes and so while they're on the session they're not checking email and not paying attention that could be embarrassing. Uh, you also might want to ask questions, uh, ask audience questions uh, to, to follow up with an action. So I did, in fact, I said, if you have any questions, you want to put it in the chat area. Uh, if you have any, any questions, you can also raise your hand by using that little icon, okay? 
Um, if I ask uh, a question and I, I have, it's a polling question, it might be a yes or no response, or it might be uh, A, B, C, or D, uh, you ask them to do that. Or, you know, someone might just, uh, like I'm going to do an emoticon, okay, or an emoji. Okay, so, and it may be that one is good, and thumbs up, you know, no, no necessary uh, clarification required. So these are important things to uh, to keep in mind so that you know your students are still paying attention to you. All right. Uh, using the audio chat feature, you have students raise their hand to speak, and, and and usually I do this because I don't want to have everyone turning on the microphone at the same time. There used to be a limit of six people could turn on the microphone at the same time, but uh, consider this: when one person talks, it's uh, it's voice, okay? It's uh, it's it's communication. Now, maybe not all, not, not all people have equal skills in that area, uh, but if two people are speaking at the same time, then it becomes noise. If three, four, or six people are trying to talk at the same time, then it's really unintelligible, okay? So you want to have some sort of an etiquette or protocol for people to follow regarding this. So they have a question, raise their hand, and you'll say yes. Please address the person. Uh, you know, you want to want to talk to, and so they'll say, uh, they'll click on the uh, little little icon of the microphone. They said, "I have a question. I want to ask the instructor," or it may be that you have a, you have a question you want to ask one of your fellow students. Okay, and that's also a possibility. Usually, if you do that in a chat feature, you're going to have a, an at sign. So, at uh, Bill. So somebody's asking a question for Bill, and Bill would see that, and he would be able to respond. He would know that that's specifically addressed to him. Okay. Now, managing large courses. Actually, this came up. So Denise, uh, when we raise your hand to speak, what do you see as the instructor to help manage that? Do you see us all listed? Well, actually, if I'm looking at the, if I am looking at uh, the chat feature. I'll see, you know, people's chat features. So what will happen is that when you raise your hand, a little, a uh, little box will pop up. In fact, I'll do it so you can see it myself. Let's see. Is that a little a box will pop up and it will show me that somebody's asking a question. Now, if I'm not paying attention, uh, that I might miss that. And if I haven't set made the settings so that it'll it'll have a little audio tone, then I may I might really uh, uh, mess it. But if I click down in and, and attendees, I will see a list of all the people currently in the session, and it'll, it'll be a little hand raised icon right beside the name. So I'm going to ask Matt to click on the hand raise feature. OK, and you can see, uh, well, I can see that Matt has raised his hands. If you guys click on the uh, participants, which is that in the, in the, in the Collaborate panel, it's, it's where you have two figures close to close. If you click on that, you're going to see that Matt and as as myself, I'm going to see that Matt. I mean, as as Jody, I can see that Matt's asked the question. So you can actually see that that someone's asked. And when I respond to that question, I'm going to click on lower hand. So now me as the instructor who is in, in charge of that, like this. Now Matt's uh, hand raised has been lowered, and I hopefully I will respond to his his feature. All right. So having a different session for larger uh, for larger audiences, and in fact, this is the case. I have a, a person who actually has multiple sections, and, and she was concerned about having all of them meet at the same time, and it would probably be more more than 100 people. So I made the suggestion: well, might, you might want to have multiple sessions uh, so that people come in maybe two sessions, you may want to split it up, or maybe three sessions, or maybe even four sessions. It's more work for you, but it's, it becomes more manageable. Uh, you might want to recruit uh, a GA or a TA to assist uh, you in responding to a chat message. So they may be sitting there responding to chat messages, especially if you're relatively new to using this technology. And you may, in fact, turn the chat features off if too many people are trying to talk at the same time. You might want to consider having the smaller sessions. And in that case, you might want to open up the audio and the video features to more individuals. And so like today, we have we have seven people here. Uh, and so I might actually make it, in fact, all of you do have that option to be able to turn that, on, that, that feature on. Uh, also, because we have fewer people, I might want to increase interactive elements, so like maybe putting people into groups or having people respond to questions. It becomes a little bit specific questions, so specific individuals. Uh, one of the uh, other considerations in managing uh, an online course is, is you have to plan for the worst. 
And so, for instance, I, I do have my PowerPoint slide presentation, but if I was, if for, for some reason it wasn't coming up, there is a feature which I haven't really talked about, which is the application share. So I could actually have a PowerPoint presentation running in the background, and if my PowerPoint presentations weren't working in this venue right here, I could actually open up that application and share this with everyone uh, in the course. So that, so that would be an app, is that would be planning for the worst scenario. Something's not working. Um, also, you want to tell the students, you know, that, that the importance of good internet connectivity. We had someone uh, trying to get on a little while ago, and I suspect the issue had to do with with uh, using Wi-Fi. Maybe it wasn't a great Wi-Fi connection. Uh, wired is always better than wireless. Uh, but also, I'm going to follow up with that individual who's having some problems, and I'm going to say, don't worry about it. We've recorded the session, and uh, and so they'll they'll be able to still view the session even though they were not able to stay here for whatever reason. And, and having backup materials, as I mentioned, I actually have a PowerPoint slide presentation running in the background just in case uh, something should have gone wrong. All right. We're, we're winding down here to the last, uh, last few slides. I'm going to ask, are there any questions regarding the management? And I'm going to click on the chat feature. And I'm waiting for any questions or maybe any hand raises on questions about management. Okay, I don't see anyone putting anything or if somebody is typing, it'll pop up that somebody is typing, preparing to type. So so let's move on to the next one. All right, follow-up. This actually hap happens after the session is over, it's done, it's complete. You might actually review the session in an email to the students or you might actually send it a Blackboard announcement. And it could be that uh, maybe we had an issue with connectivity. Maybe I, the instructor, was having a problem. Although that's not likely to happen, especially if I'm using a, a wired connection. But I might say, I'm so sorry you guys missed people who were not able to stay in the session. Uh, don't worry, though. I have recorded the session, and I'm going to provide a link to the recording uh, so that students don't have to worry about that. So this is an opportunity for me to close up any loose ends in the session, whether that's technical or maybe somebody brought up a question that was pedagogical or related to the course. Uh, or the content, uh, then we say, this is a really interesting thing. I think we'll follow this up in this week's discussion board forum, uh, uh, something that was unexpected. Uh, you might also want to take this opportunity to ask students themselves for feedback. You know, uh, what was beneficial about this session? What would you like to see more of? What was uh, problematic? So I can integrate that, and it, it, it's considered process evaluation. I can actually make changes immediately rather than waiting for the end of the semester to get that follow-up student uh, course evaluation. So Don, Don has a comment. She says, I don't have any questions, but I do need to leave the session for, okay, from clinic. Thank you for the information, and we'll review the rest of the information when it becomes available. Thank you so much, Don, for your consideration. I appreciate and totally understandable. Uh, once again, I appreciate your, your participation. All right, any questions regarding this, this follow-up? All right. All right. No questions. All right. I'm going to have some additional tips for you in the last few minutes here. I'm going to ask you if you're starting with, with uh, online teaching, if you're using this uh, virtual session, to start simple, which means you probably don't want to use all the fancy, um, all the fancy features initially. Like you don't want to do application share because it is a little challenging, and 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 there are some recommendations for that that I share when I do have people ask me about that. Uh, you probably uh, want to think about how many, well, if you want to ask polling questions, you might want to ask one or two uh, polling questions, and that's totally understandable. But as you proceed and you get more comfortable with it, uh, you might want to ask more. You want, you know, application share is also going to be an important consideration too. Or the breakout, uh, the breakout rooms, uh, great feature, very important, uh, but one that I probably would say to hold off on until you develop some experience with the with uh, this web conferencing tool. You want to add more interactivity as you feel more comfortable, and those features that I just mentioned are in fact interactivity tools, and so you want to develop that. You want to sort of back into it slowly, maybe one foot at a time, uh, and as you gain more experience. You're looking, you'll be looking forward to doing it, and your students will be looking forward uh, to doing it as you become uh, more adept at using this technology. There's nothing more unnerving to a faculty member than to be looking uh, as incompetent or inept and in using something. So 
work it slowly, all right? You want to seek to learn advanced uses of technology software, and that's where maybe uh, myself, I, or one of my colleagues comes in and, and asks, you know, how do you use that application share feature? You talked about it. I'd like to see what it looks like. I'd like to try it myself. And so that's something you do a little bit later on. All right, so what additional questions or comments or suggestions uh, do you have for the folks who are still in the session? So I'm going to wait here a minute. Right now it's about 12.57, and I'll wait a minute for anyone to come in and, and ask any questions. I have something to add right here. I'm looking at the camera, and from time to time I look down on the slides, which are just below it. Uh, if, in fact, you decide to go with using the camera, you really want to have some sort of reminder to look at the camera. I have a colleague who actually has these two. Um, oh, I, can, I can show you one of them right now. This is an eyeball. Okay, if you can see that. She actually has two eyeballs right in front of the camera, so it looks like somebody's looking at you. So it actually is a, an indicator, uh, uh, a reminder to make sure you're looking at the camera. Now, now typically, I, I use the camera only for the first, the initial couple of minutes so that I establish that instructor presence and then I'll turn it off. Um, but if I'm um, in somewhat disarray, I have a mess behind me, or I'm in my pajamas, which is probably never going to happen when I do this, um, I will probably not have the webcam on at all. What type of microphone or headset would you recommend? Great question. Um, actually, uh, I'm, right now, I'm using a Logitech, uh, the, and Logitech uh, USB headset mics, it's a combination of the two. Uh, they have many, many models, and of course, the pricing structure is anywhere from uh, 10 bucks to a couple of hundred bucks. Uh, what I like to do is use something that has uh, a boom. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have one that actually is bendable. This is a hard plastic one. But I like to adjust that in case I'm speaking, and sometimes I will pronounce words that have P, the P sound, and it might pop and it might distort the sound. So I like to adjust that. So if this was actually one of those uh, adjustable ones, the flexible ones, I would use that and I would push, put it in a situation so it's not directly in front of me. But I like to keep it close to, to my mouth. Also, the, uh, the ears, right now if you can see, there is a soft plastic cushion. If you have a hard plastic, that'll get that'll get so old so quickly. You, especially if you, you plan to do it, uh, use this regularly. You want to get the most comfortable one. So, depending on your budget, you get something which which uh, will serve you well. And this particular headset is relatively robust; it will last for a long time. Um, but it may be at a certain point if I decide I'm going to be doing this much more frequently, I'm going to get go for a, a little bit higher end, maybe spend a few more bucks and getting something that's that, that's appropriate. It's always better to have a USB headset rather than the analog of the two plugs. You know, one goes into the microphone, one goes in, into uh, the speaker uh, function. USB handles handles that beautifully, and it also goes in as a digital signal instead of an analog signal. Uh, so that's, that's my recommendation. Just want to remind you that I will be sending you a link, and it'll probably be going to YouTube, but eventually it's going to end up on this page, Workshop Recordings. Right now, this recording just has one. This page just has one recording for 2018. It should have, have more, uh, but eventually this recording will go there. But in the meantime, I will send you the link to the recording uh, from YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash factdev or Twitter. Okay, so as we wind down, I'd like to thank you once again for attending this, this workshop. My name is Dan Cabrera. This is my email address if you have any questions. Thank you so much, everyone, Bill, Ryan, Denise, Matt, Don, uh, for attending to today's session. If you have any questions, follow-up questions, feel free to, to contact me. I'm happy to respond to that. You're welcome, Matt. Good luck to you all. And I hope to, uh, to hear good stories about your online experiences. Have a good day.